I think there's many weird parts about the Meng Wanzhou case. When she was being stopped in Vancouver, the police like rummaged through all her goods. The Canadian border services had orders from the U.S. government, go find evidence. When a Canadian gets in trouble, a lot of times the Chinese law will be a little bit nicer to them. But after the Meng Wanzhou case, it's sort of like, okay, you want to play hardball? We can play hardball. We're going to arrest the Michaels. We're going to give the Canadian guy the death sentence, which is what we would give Chinese people. What Miss Meng Wanzhou is accused of doing, facilitating payments through HSBC to E. Ron, currently under U.S. sanctions. Main issue, it was whether it was in violation of the U.S. law, not Canadian law, and it was. It is a clear breach of the law. She should return to the U.S. to face prosecution. I kind of disagree with Avin. I think the judge could have made a different decision. When the U.S. unilaterally sanctions a country, does that have any basis in international law? I don't think it does. So the U.S. just does these things like the world's dictator. They spy on everyone with NSA, and they arrest people based on the spying, and it gets the executives to like actually forfeit their companies. Maybe it is somewhat self-defeating if Canada was to ban Huawei altogether because they would need to replicate this technology all over again. If you're really worried about data being collected, then you have to ban America because they are the biggest perpetrators of this. They were even hacking Angela Merkel's phone. When America went to war in Iraq, Canada didn't. That's really, really good. And if Canada could do that again, man, I would be so happy. And if Canada could allow a true free market of ideas, that would do a lot for a Canada-China relationships. Hey guys, bonjour à tous, it's Key Bros. So welcome back to part two of our Canadian episode of Soft Talk. Let me remind you that we're talking to two guests from Canada. They are New Moves and Avid. So without further ado, let's start with the first question. The relationship between Canada and China is at an all-time low at the moment. The most notable incident is the detainment of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou and her possible extradition to the USA. What do you think about this saga? Do you think that she should be released? First off, a little bit of background into the law. Canada and the US have an extradition agreement. If the US requests that Canada send someone back to the US to face prosecution, Canada would typically send that person along, subject to a few exceptions, none of which would seem to apply in this case, except for if there was any sort of political motivation or if there was no real legal basis. That was what Ms. Meng Wanzhou tried to argue President Trump in his overall dispute with China sought to inject some political animus into the extradition request. Based on the law at hand, I do think that the judge got the law right in this case. The case is decided such that Ms. Meng Wanzhou, she did need to be extradited to the U.S. There wasn't any dispute that her side could raise. I think there's still a question of whether she will appeal the case to the British Columbia Court of Appeal and then onwards to the Supreme Court of Canada. But what Ms. Meng Wanzhou is accused of doing, facilitating payments through HSBC to Iran, currently under U.S. sanctions. If those turned out to be true, then they are in violation of the sanctions. It is a clear breach of the law. She should return to the U.S. to face prosecution. Her side tried to argue these payments through HSBC to Iran were not in violation of Canadian law, but that was not the main issue. It was whether it was in violation of the U.S. law, and it was. So the judge, I would submit, she was right to order the extradition. I kind of disagree with Avin. I think there's many weird parts about the Meng Wanzhou case. I think the judge could have made a different decision because I heard when she was being stopped in Vancouver, the police like rummaged through all her goods. They knew what they were doing. They were trying to find evidence of wrongdoing on her phone, on her hard drives. So that right there, that's clear that the Canadian border services had orders from the U.S. government, go find evidence. And also, it's very clear that Trump did politicize the situation. I mean, back in 2018, Trump said, hey, if we can make a trade deal, we can talk about Meng Wanzhou and yeah. throw that into the deal. So he definitely politicized it, made it seem as if this is part of the trade war. Arresting executives from other countries is just ridiculous. And it's happened before. It's, I believe it was a French company, Alstom. They arrested a bunch of executives 10 years ago. They wrote a book called The American Trap and how America does these kinds of things. They spy on everyone with NSA. And they arrest people based on the spying and it gets the executives to like actually forfeit their companies. So Alstom had to sell parts of his company to GE. In return, there were a couple of Canadian nationals were detained in China. Two were being charged with espionage or spying offenses. Others were being charged with drug trafficking offenses. What is your view on these detainments? Do you think it is a fair deal if let's say China and Canada trade prisoners of men going back to China and these Canadian nationals going back to Canada? I don't want to make too many speculations 
calculations, but the two Michaels, they seem to be working for the government because the way Justin Trudeau talked about them doing a trade, I don't know about that because I just don't think Meng Wanzhou should be treated like a criminal. When the U.S. unilaterally sanctions a country, does that have any basis in international law? I don't think it does. So the U.S. just does these things like the world's dictator. When they sanction random countries for random reasons, I don't think that really has a lot of legal basis. But I guess because Canada has an extradition deal with the U.S., Evans correct that the U.S. asks for someone, Canada sends them, right? Let me give you a really interesting like layman view of what happens in mainland China. What Western media never talks about is the fact that us foreigners in China, we always get a free ride. For example, if I'm a foreigner in China, especially if I'm white or like black, very obviously foreigner, I don't get that privilege. If you're an obvious foreigner in China, you don't wear a helmet, you're like riding a motorcycle. Most Chinese police officers aren't going to care. They're going to be like, okay, you're a foreigner. Don't worry about it. Give you a little talk. Like, okay, please wear a helmet next time. But they wouldn't do that with a Chinese person. Here's your ticket. You broke the law. They sort of give foreigners a little bit of slack. You don't understand the laws. You don't understand the culture. So that's what happened with the Canadian drug dealer. He was dealing a lot of drugs. I believe it was like four kilos of MDMA or something like that. And he was shipping it to Thailand. So he got caught and then he got 20 years in China, which is totally not the norm. There's a very extreme law in China. China is very anti-drug because of the opium wars. 150 years ago, hundreds of millions of Chinese were getting addicted to opium, which were being smuggled in from Britain. And so anyone trafficking drugs will get like the death penalty for every kilo. So the Canadian deserves like four death penalties. But he didn't get that because he's Canadian. Because of the Meng Wanzhou thing, China was like, okay, you want to be tough on Chinese citizens in Canada? We can apply the regular law to your citizens as well. Canadians have always been looked favorably in China because there's a lot of Canadian heroes in China. If you guys don't know this, there's a really famous Canadian called Norman Bethune. He was communist and he fought alongside the CPC doing medical care and saving a lot of Chinese lives. Even in Toronto, there's a school in Scarborough called Dr. Norman Bethune, and my friends went there. Even in Canada, we named some schools and places after Bethune, and in China, he is a famous Canadian. There's also another famous Canadian that you guys probably don't know about. His name is Dashan. He's a comedian. He's just amazing at Mandarin. He has better Mandarin than Guangzhou people. Guangzhou Mandarin is terrible. <laughs> Dashan, this white Canadian guy, just rips off this amazing, like, Ni zai nar, the R Y E. Like, when a Canadian gets in trouble, a lot of times the Chinese law will be a little bit nicer to them. But after the Meng Guangzhou case, it's sort of like, okay, you want to play hardball? We can play hardball. We're going to arrest the Michaels. We're going to give the Canadian guy the death sentence, which is what we would give Chinese people. About whether these two Michaels worked for the Canadian government. I know one of them was a former diplomat, and the other one is, I think, a consultant who works in China, but whether there should be an exchange. It's difficult because typically countries might be against exchanging prisoners because it would just encourage other countries to take hostage citizens use as bargaining. But in this case, it seems to be a very specific set of circumstances. You have Wang Wanzhou, who the US wants, and then you just have two maybe government workers or maybe random Canadian citizens in China. The circumstances are so unique. But I guess there's a bigger question of to what degree the U.S. foreign policy is influencing Canada. Any country which engages the U.S. financial system uses something called the SWIFT so if you're transferring money between two parties and at any point in the transfer, the U.S. is involved, then the U.S. can set sanctions against countries in which the banks which are transferring the funds are located. That's really why the U.S. is able to exercise so much influence around the world, if only because most of the world uses the U.S. financial system, trades in U.S. dollars. Ever since President Trump was elected, and he has perhaps enforced this sanction law far more frequently than any of his predecessors ever did, see the European Union and perhaps China, to a degree, try to set up some parallel money transfer system so that they don't have to engage the U.S. system they don't have to fall foul the sanctions. So we can get around the political motivation for trading prisoners. So new moves were suggesting that China traditionally has a very serious anti-drug policy. From what I gather, that seems to be common throughout Southeast Asia. It's not just China that has this sort of law. Australian tourists, for example, who might travel to Singapore or Malaysia, if they're found with so much as a gram of marijuana on their person, that's life in prison or perhaps the death penalty. 
with the drug dealer case, I think it is a little bit suspicious, but they are applying regular domestic law in this case. So I would be far more hesitant to suggest that the drug dealer case was revenge as opposed to the two Michaels, which perhaps is a more parallel to the Meng Wanzhou case. According to a survey which has been conducted by the Pew Research Center, 67% of Canadians actually have an unfavorable view of China. So why do you think both the liberals and conservatives in Canada hate China? And what are the reasons for this constant China bashing both in the Canadian media and also in day-to-day -day life in Canada. I call it propaganda by omission. So just by never showing you information that you, you should know, that's a kind of propaganda. If I was to talk about my friend and I only talked about his good points, he only said, oh, he's super handsome. He's like the nicest person. And I left out the fact that he stole all the food from the fridge or flirted with my girlfriend. You're only getting one very slanted point of view of this guy. That's exactly what's happening with Western media. And I think if they saw more videos presenting what's happening on the ground in China, I think they would change their mind, I think. Like I said, I was very anti-China for my whole life. And only after traveling here and living here, I slowly changed. I was indoctrinated and now I've unindoctrinated myself. I think liberal conservative consensus is based on this overall anti-China campaign that the West in general has, not just Canada, the Five Eyes. I think it's very unfortunate. I would love peace. That's why I made my channel. I would love to have world peace and not containment and color revolutions. Thank God Hong Kong did not become a Syria, seriously. Right now, we're seeing a transfer of power from the West to the East. The last time that there was such a transfer between global superpowers, you have to go back Back to really start of the 20th century from the UK to the US. People might have been more comfortable with that transition because the UK and the US had similar legal, social, and economic principles. People in the UK, they might have felt somewhat uneasy about having to take a step back, but at the same time, they might have felt a bit more comfortable knowing that even if the US supplanted them as the global superpower, they were still so similar to the UK that there wouldn't be much of a change. Whereas now you have the U.S. which is ceding power to China and many people in the West might feel uneasy about surrendering their position at the top to a foreign power which has different legal traditions to what they're accustomed. I do think that some of this unease between liberals and conservatives that they share about China is simply because if China was to become the dominant superpower, many people in Canada, they might feel that that they wake up one morning and they'll have to get used to a different way of life. Now, I would suggest that is not what China necessarily wants. China wants to be a participant in the global economy, which is something separate to what the Soviet Union wanted. They wanted to completely supplant the US capitalist system with the socialist system. I do think that some of the fears in the West are unfounded. Canada may potentially ban Huawei, and in fact, all the major Canadian telecom network providers, Bell, Telus, and Rogers, have all decided to choose Ericsson over Huawei to develop its 5G network. What is your view on this potential ban by a government? Do you see Huawei as a national security threat? And if such a ban does take place, do you think it is against the free market principles of Canada? Right now, I think it's just the US, Australia, and soon to be the UK that will ban Huawei from their 5G networks. Canada has delayed its decision supposedly, but I think many people, they understand that this delay is just the pretense for a ban. If Huawei was to participate in building up the 5G networks in any capacity, whether it is just building these cell towers or having a bit more of an intimate partnership with the cell phone providers. So in Canada, you have the big three, Rogers, Bell, and TELUS. Right now, I think it's just TELUS and Rogers that have Huawei technology in their cell towers. They were petitioning the Canadian government to say, okay, you want to ban Huawei from some of the more sensitive technologies, but let us keep cell towers at least because it would cost billions of dollars to replace this. So from that perspective, I would think maybe it is somewhat self-defeating if Canada was to ban Huawei altogether because they would need to replicate this technology all over again. There's a suspicion that Canada is doing this, if only because the US is ordering them to. With China and supercomputers, I think it was maybe 20 years ago, the West banned such exports of 
these computers to China. And now I think China has four of the 10 fastest supercomputers in the world. From an economic perspective, I think it's self-defeating to ban Huawei from a national security perspective. Maybe it's reasonable. I don't know enough about that. From a competitiveness perspective, it is likewise self-defeating. It's idiotic to ban Huawei. Logically think about it, right? If we're banning 5G towers because we're worried that the Chinese government might be sipping information, then you have to ban everything from China. Because China's making everything. All the laptops, all the iPhones, it's making everything. China could be sneaking in back doors into every single fucking device that it's selling. And more importantly, America has already proven to be the biggest spy of the world, right? Like if you look at what Edward Snowden came out with in 2013, he just wrote a book called Permanent Record, came out yeah. last year, 2019. He just put it all out there. The NSA's master plan, they've been collecting all the world's metadata for 10 years and storing it in these huge data centers in Utah, I believe. If you're really worried worried about data being collected, then you have to ban America because they are the biggest perpetrators of this. They were even hacking Angela Merkel's phone. If you look at it from a war perspective, it makes sense. If you want to try to hurt China, try to contain China, yeah, of course, let's ban all of their stuff. Let's ban Huawei, let's ban TikTok, let's ban WeChat, which they're trying to do. But from a, like, a logical point of view, no sense. And from an economical point of view, I totally agree with Avin. China's just going to develop its own semiconductors, its own everything. All these moves from the US have increased Chinese nationalism on the mainland. I do agree with that point. President Obama signed the Iran nuclear deal. It was thought he did so, if only because it would weaken the hardliners' influence in Iran such that more of the people would be more sympathetic to the U.S. perspective. And I do see some parallel to that with China. If the West was a bit more accommodating to China, perhaps that would weaken the more hardliners' perspective in China. Whereas if the West was to shun China, then that would only promote the hardliners' perspective that, okay, the West, they see us as an enemy, well, then we should see the West as an enemy likewise. Despite the tensions between Canada and China, China still remains Canada's largest trading partner in Asia and the second largest trading partner in the world if we exclude the EU, which is not a country. How do you think this tension can be resolved in the future? Canada and the US have been traditionally close allies. So whatever the US's foreign policy, Canada soon adopts as its own. There are very few divergences between Canada and the US. Although with President Trump coming into power, it has perhaps cracked that traditional artifice. There have been some divergences between Canada and the US. One one of which I think is China. China is one of Canada's biggest trading partners, so Canada is reluctant to lose that, even though Canada might be a bit more outspoken about some of the human rights controversies in China. It's often joked about in Canada that those criticisms are more muted whenever federal ministers visit China for trade missions. Going forward, perhaps from an economic perspective, Canada can realign itself with China, but I think the best policy would simply be dependent on who wins the next US presidential election, because Canada by itself, I mean, we're a middle power, we are no threat to China. If we speak out diplomatically, the only way we can exercise any sort of influence is if we gather other countries to our cause. So we saw that with the two Michaels, where Canada managed to gather a coalition of its allies to speak out against China, and then China responded, Canada, you should not be doing this. Maybe if Canada gathers a coalition of the willing, it might be possible, owing to present circumstances with many countries adopting a more nativist, nationalist policy, that would be difficult. But I do think that that is the best way forward, because Canada Canada is simply too small internationally to exercise much influence by itself. I didn't realize that China was one of the largest trading partners of Canada, but that's not a surprise because China is actually the largest trading nation on earth. That's a hopeful thing. The fact that China and Canada have such a nice economic relationship, it means that going forward, there is a chance we can just stop this new Cold War in its tracks. And let's just have peaceful, respectable relationships. I think that's a much better model than what happened previously with Russia. So I hope that will convince a lot of people to step back a little bit from America's aggressiveness. Canada can speak up. They've done this a few times in the past. When America went to war in Iraq, Canada didn't. That's really, really good. And if Canada could do that again, man, I would be so happy. If Canada bans Huawei and goes with Nokia, they're basically paying two or three times more for the same product. 
That's not good for Canada. Canada's gonna lose a lot if it tries to be aggressive. The biggest battleground in the new Cold War is the media. The fact that voices like Max Blumenthal, an amazing investigative reporter, he never gets on any mainstream shows. Because the mainstream media doesn't want to hear real investigative reporting. I just watched a video on YouTube by Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winning economist. He talks about China in a very favorable way and he never gets invited on CNN. We're only getting these very politicized voices. We're not getting experts. We're not even getting people like Avid. Just in intelligent, normal people. And if Canada could allow a true free market of ideas, that would do a lot for Canada-China relationships. Before we end, we have a few questions directed to our new moves. As a Canadian citizen, do you ever have an identity clash between your Canadian nationality and your Chinese roots? Which country do you identify with more? I identify as Canadian because I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Uh, when I go to China, they don't really understand because I look like everyone else. So they get very confused when I say I'm Canadian. They watch Hollywood movies and when they think about America and Canada, they just think about white people. Kind of sad that Chinese people are brainwashed to think that Americans and Canadians are white. That's not true. Did I ever feel confused when I lived in Canada? Absolutely. I think a lot of Canadians do. You grow up in this country where you have like maybe some Chinese values, maybe some Indian values, maybe some Jamaican values. There's so many people in Toronto and they all bring other cultural values to the table. But then the majority of Canadians are kind of this like white group. You can't help but conform to the majority group. I just often felt in Canada that I had to be a white person. And if I displayed any of my very small Chinese values, I would be a little bit weird, socially awkward. So I always tried to hide that unique part of myself, not in an offensive way, just I wanted to fit in. I wanted to have fun with all the people in the office, go party, go drink beers. And I think many Canadians feel the way I do, like some identity crisis. How was it like growing up in Canada as an ethnic Chinese person? And did you face some sort of discrimination or prejudice? I grew up in Toronto in a very working class neighborhood. So everybody was different. There were like Indians, Jamaicans, Irish. So I felt very comfortable growing up in that area of Toronto. But there were some times people would say things like go back to China or some weird stupid shit. Whatever. I didn't really care. After graduating university, getting a job, I moved downtown like Ossington. Ossington's a very hipster area. Very cool area. I still love going there. I was shocked at the racism. I really was. Because there was one day walking down the street where I live and this white dude is just like yelling profanity at me. Fuck you. I was just shocked by it. In my neighborhood where I live, there have been instances where I've just been really surprised. Not in a good way. It's bad because I identify as Canadian. It's really strange when I get attacked just because my skin is darker or my eyes are smaller. It just goes to show that there are people that support the Trump idea that America or Canada should be white. It's really disheartening. But otherwise, I loved growing up in Canada. I'm very happy to be Canadian and I'm, I'm proud to be Canadian. Yeah. Even though I've grown up in Hong Kong, spent most of my life here, I feel like an outsider. Canada and Hong Kong are supposed to be inclusive and diverse places. Whatever language you speak, as long as people understand, that should be accepted, right? It's kind of like speaking French in Canada. You wouldn't tell a Francophone person in Canada shouldn't be speaking French, you should be speaking English instead. In the world right now, in general, there's just too much of this division. You speak English, I speak Cantonese, we're different people. But at the end of the day, we're all part of the same society. There has to be some unifying factor, right? In Hong Kong, if you tell everybody to speak Cantonese, then what about the white people here? They're also people, right? They're also Hong Kong citizens. Why do you have to divide people according to their immutable characteristics? Why can't we just all be Hong Kongers and be harmonious? Whenever I talk to my mainland friends, it's not like they'll ostracize me simply because their perception of Hong Kong people is quite negative. And it's very different from how Hong Kong people treat mainlanders. It's like, oh, you're a mainlander, you speak Mandarin, therefore I don't want to talk to you. But mainlanders have a way different mentality in relation to Hong Kongers. In Canada, my differences were kind of a liability. But in China, my differences are this huge positive where I can actually make a lot of money it's so interesting. Last question. What made you decide to come to China and debunk the so-called false accusations by the Western media with your videos? And how do you plan to continue to grow on YouTube? Just don't believe the Western media that much after the G20 protest, basically. I was at the G20 protest and the way the media covered it was completely different from how it really was because the media only showed the black bloc. People dressed all in black and smashing windows, smashing Starbucks, everything that the Hong Kong rioters were doing. And they were called terrorists in the Canadian media. They were called anarchists. There was a manhunt for every black blocker. On the front page of the Sun newspaper was a picture of a black block person. And they were identifying them. What a difference to the way they presented the Hong Kong rioters. They were all heroes. They're all people that we should like. Just did not trust the Western media after that. And that's when I started YouTubing actually about politics. Because I was at those protests and I was a peaceful protester for environment. I was there for pushing for green policies 10 years ago which thank god i think we're starting to do right i came to china simply because i don't trust the media and i want to see it for myself
So I did a backpacking trip. I was living in Korea at the time. I was teaching English in South Korea. And I just did a little backpacking during my winter vacation, which is one month long as a teacher. And I went to Shanghai, Guilin, the beautiful city with karst mountains, and Guangzhou. I just fell in love. I was just like, this is fucking cool. That's not easy to say after you live in South Korea, because I was living in Seoul, which is one of the coolest cities in the whole world. And when I went to China, I was like, this is really cool. Because I was like seeing the development of China. I want to be part of it. And I knew I could get promoted if I came to China, because I, I could see that they're making money, they're moving fast. And I did. As soon as I arrived in China, I got promoted to a vice principal immediately. That's why I arrived. And I did not want to make YouTube videos when I first came. When I first came to China, I was indoctrinated to be against China. So I didn't really trust anything about China. I didn't trust my job. I didn't trust the pay. It took me about two or three years to deprogram myself through real life experience. Not through videos like yours, but just by living life, by falling in love, by working at jobs, by starting my own business. So I was like, China's a really good, really, really good. How do I want to grow? Well, I guess maybe joining more things like this, participating in more live streams and just making good content. I think that's how I'd like to grow. So this marks the end of our video. Again, huge thank you to Avin and New Moves for coming on to our channel. Yeah, so hope you guys enjoyed our episode. Please stay tuned for the next ones. So see you in the next part. Bye.